topical study for today. We're continuing in our, our um, Bites of Prophetic Delights. We're calling that, that for our different studies. You can see this um, channel, I guess you can call it, on our YouTube channel, this playlist, where we go through prophecy and we go through different studies and we try to collect and connect different prophetic events and bring it all together, kind of even open up into the minor prophets and the major prophets and the Psalms and the, uh, the po poetic um, books of the Bible, trying to connect it all together. Uh, Cause there's a lot that goes on, tons of stuff that are going on in these books. And not too often do we get a chance to put it all together, see what's going on, kind of the big picture. And uh, you know, this is, these, these studies help put it all together so that when you're reading and studying and learning the Bible and reading it for yourself and studying for yourself, you get to see a lot of what's going on. So this is kind of the, the point and the purpose of it is that we get, we get to plug, we get to collect the dots and then connect the dots. And these are good ways to do this. Uh, today we're calling this, as actually the past couple of studies have been, we've been titling these uh, dessert studies. We went through the Lord's laughing at uh, his end time nations trying to destroy him. We called the Lord's Snickers, which was Psalm 2, verse 4. That was about three studies ago. Then we did a two-part study called Job's Three Musketeers. You know, we, so we're getting Snickers in one study and Three Musketeers in another. And we had so much to talk about in Job's Three Friends or Job's Three Musketeers that it took two studies to do it in. And so we did that for the past two studies. So we've gone through Psalm chapter 2, Job chapter 2. Now we're going into Hosea chapter 7. And so in Hosea chapter 7, we're seeing here in verse 8, it says here, uh, Ephraim, he hath mixed himself among the people. Ephraim is a cake, not turned. And if you think about just the concept of what he's even talking about here, we'll get into it deeper. But what Hosea is even talking about here is that he's saying that Ephraim is uh, is a cake not turned. If you think about how uh, if you're if you're cooking, say even a pancake, and you don't turn it over, you just cook it on one side. It's like it's half baked or it's only cooked on one side. It's it's pretty much useless if you don't cook the other side of it. Uh, it's a cake not turned over. It's a cake not flipped over. It's a cake not turned. So you've got one side of it. It's it's half baked. It's 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 really not you know, digestible or, or usable or anything like that. It's, it's half half turned, as it says there. Or cake not turned, I'm sorry, cake not turned. So it's cooked on one side, but not on the other. Uh, you, you can't do much with it. And you're saying Israel, or, you know, specifically Ephraim, you're pretty much unusable to me. As long as you're idolatrous, as long as you're uh, unbelieving, as long as you're uh, going to act this useless towards you know, uh, what the Lord is doing in prophecy, you're you're just like a cake not turned, is what he's saying. And so as we go through this, we're seeing in Hosea chapter 7, as we go through it today, is, is uh, Hosea's half-baked cake is what we're calling it. So we're going from Snickers to Three Musketeers to a half-baked cake. And this is kind of where we're in and what we're studying today. So in the book of Hosea, uh, going into our outline and our introduction, uh, God speaks to the northern kingdom, you know, in their idolatry. And so all of uh, chapter 7 is going to speak about this. It's going to talk about to the politics of the northern kingdom and their idolatry and their culture and their and their idolatry and everything else. The illustration that's given, as we just talked about, is about a half-baked uh, cake, or, or as it says there, a cake not turned. And this is what unbelieving Israel is like. They're pretty much useless. And so we'll go through this to help illustrate what kind of book Jose is all about and what he's referring to in chapter 7 here. So... Uh, we'll go through and take a look at that, but as Hosea uh, prophesies, during this, Israel's at the peak of their power here, and uh, Israel's the most powerful nation pretty much in the eastern Mediterranean around this time, and they're they're wealthy, and, and they're experiencing all sorts of prosperity, so they're kind of uh, experiencing all sorts of things, but yet in, within 40 years after this, Israel's going to be no more because God is going to send Assyria. Uh, after the northern kingdom, and he's going to send Babylon after the southern kingdom of Judah. And this is all part of the five courses of judgment that you find in Leviticus chapter 26, based on their covenant standing. Um, they either need to change their mind, you know, also known as, you know, they need to repent of their idolatrous ways. Otherwise, they're going to be taken away according to what God promised them and what they agreed to in Leviticus chapter 26. We'll go over that as well, but pretty much to give a quick rundown so that we're not 
going through absolutely everything in Hosea, but we do the quick zoom through. Hosea is you know, an Old Testament prophet, and Israel is so wicked in their way, so idolatrous, so unfaithful to God. God tells this Old Testament prophet Hosea, go and marry a prostitute. And Hosea says, well, why should I do this? And, and he's saying, because you represent, God says, you represent me. And this prostitute named Gomer, a uh, harlot named Gomer, represents Israel in their wicked ways, in their evil ways. And as you marry her, you're going to show that she's not going to be faithful to you no matter what you do. This represents Israel. This represents you know Judah and Ephraim, or, or actually not Judah, but the northern kingdom, Ephraim. And no matter what you do to try to be faithful to her, she is not going to be faithful to you. And so they're saying this is a representation of how bad Israel is. And they're not supposed to be bad. They're supposed to be the holy people. And they're so bad that as you go through chapters, uh, Hosea chapter 1, Hosea chapter 2, Hosea chapter 3, you see a picture of this. You see in Hosea chapter 1, it talks about the marriage and the children. You see this in Hosea chapter 1. Hosea chapter 2, you see Gomer, that's the name of the, of the woman, and you see that it's about God's dealing with the unfaithful wife. And you see, we'll get, we'll get some verses in there, not too much. Um, chapter 3 talks about the restoration uh, you know, to the wife, per se, um, but nonetheless, it's, it's because uh, God is faithful, uh, and not so much uh, anything else, but the, it's showing God's faithfulness, even though Gomer is uh, rebellious. So we see that there. And then when you get into chapters 4 and 5 and 6 and 7, you're showing God's, God's constant dealing with an adulterous, idolatrous, rebellious nation. And then we'll get into chapter 7 in a minute, as God is constantly frustrated with the culture and the politics of, of this idolatrous nation. And he's keep, he keeps telling them in chapter 8, you're going to keep sowing the wind and reaping a whirlwind of trouble for yourselves, Israel. And then you know, there's going to be an expulsion in chapter 9. And then chapter 10 is all about Assyria, according to Leviticus chapter 26, will destroy you. This will take place. This is a thing. This will absolutely happen to you. Uh, chapter 11 through 13 talks about God's historical struggle with Israel. This has always been a thing where this is not just only now during the time of Hosea, but there's been historical struggle. Uh, God's had, you know, struggles in the past uh, from Hosea's past uh, into the current moment of the book of Hosea, which uh, is roughly around 760 B.C.-ish. Uh, and so this is where this is taking place. But then chapter 14 talks about uh, God's promise of restoration, irregardless of their rebellion, irregardless of their idolatry and their adulterous ways. And so we see this, you know, this is pretty much the book of Hosea. But as we go back into Hosea chapter 7, and we see that this is where God is going to talk to them about how frustrated he is with their culture and their politics. You can also see a lot of spiritual lessons with what God probably could, maybe could say about, you know, how he thinks about uh, the culture and politics of uh, the Gentile wicked world, you know, today, from, if you think about Paul in Galatians 1-4, we live in a present evil world, Romans 8, you know, the sufferings of this present world, that type of thing. If you just keep that in the back of your mind as we kind of read this, but yet you know, we know Hosea is not written to us. We're not in the book of Hosea. The body of Christ does not fit doctrinally in here, but yeah, we can learn a lot from it. So we'll see here in Hosea chapter 7, as we go into verse 1, he says, uh, when I would have uh, healed Israel, then the iniquity of Ephraim was discovered, and the wickedness of Samaria, for they commit falsehood, and the chief, I'm sorry, the thief cometh in, and the troop of robbers uh, spoileth without. So he starts out in chapter 7 talking about, it, he says, when I would have healed Israel, then the iniquity of Ephraim was discovered. So he's saying, even when I came about, the Lord is, is saying, when I would have come about to heal you, when it was time to actually, you know, get through all this and work past all your troubles and work past all of this iniquity and idolatry and, and, and everything else, he says, uh, then the iniquity of Ephraim was discovered. You know, the more I tried to dig deep and, and, and get past all your issues and problems, the more problems and issues were discovered. 
is what God is saying here in verse 1. If we look at, say, uh, even when Lord Jesus Christ said this to Jerusalem, I believe it's Matthew chapter 23, verse 37. When the Lord Jesus Christ shows up on the scene in the Old Testament book of Matthew. And that is the Old Testament book of Matthew, chapter 23 and verse 37. Just as he's saying, when I would have healed Israel, then the iniquity of Ephraim was discovered and the wickedness of Samaria. We see here the same kind of theme or concept coming up from Matthew 23, verse 37. It says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as the hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. For I say unto you, ye shall not see me henceforth, till ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. So he's saying, I, he's saying it, uh, I have gathered, how often would I have gathered thy children together? How often would I do this? He says, but ye would not. You, you're not having it, Jerusalem. This is what the Lord Jesus Christ is saying to Israel in Matthew 23. I would have gathered you, you know, all together so much, but you, you're not having it. As Hosea, as God is saying to Israel here, he goes, when I would have healed Israel, then the uh, iniquity of Ephraim was discovered in the wickedness of Samaria. You know, the more I go to try to do something for you, the more wickedness is, is being, you know, found out. And so we see that as we go back to Hosea chapter 7, uh, in verse 1, he says, And the wickedness of Samaria, for they commit falsehood, and the thief cometh in, and the troop of robbers uh, spoileth without. So we see the same. If we look at Hosea 5.15, going back two chapters, we see a little bit about it here. And he says here, I will go and return uh, to my place till they acknowledge their offense and seek my face. In their affliction, they will seek me early. So he talks about that concerning their affliction. And this is what he mentions here. If you look at Hosea chapter 4 in verse 1, talking a little bit about what he was saying earlier. He says, hear, hear the word of the Lord, ye children of Israel, for the Lord hath a controversy with the inhabitants of the land, because there is no truth, nor mercy, nor knowledge of God in the land. By swearing and lying and killing and stealing and committing adultery, they break out, and blood toucheth blood. So when he goes there and he talks about this, this is the type of culture that's going on. This is why the Lord has problems with what's going on there in Ephraim and, and Samaria and everything else. And this is why he's saying, um, for they commit falsehood and the thief cometh in and the troop of robbers spoileth without. That's just the flat out day to day culture that's going on now in Ephraim and Judah. And that's not supposed to be. There's supposed to be a kingdom of priests, as we know from Exodus. That's what they're supposed to be. But as we saw in Hosea chapter 4, verse 2, uh, it's all about swearing and lying and killing and stealing and committing adultery. That's what it's about now, day by day by day by day. And that's why he's saying, the thief cometh in all about stealing, and the troop of robbers spoileth without. That's a day by day by day thing, instead of it all being about what the, what's happening with um, a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. Uh, being the head and not the tail of all the other nations, it's not about that anymore. They're so wicked and so rebellious and so idolatrous that the Lord has to tell them that this is your day-to-day -day life now. It's 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 horrific. It's terrible. And this this can't stand. This is not a right thing. You know, if, uh, if this continues, continues on, and it's going to, Assyria will be what they will suffer as they will be taken away out of the land by Assyria. So we see that there. And uh, even if we look at Hosea chapter 6, verse 7, you see a little more about this. just want to keep looking at the cross-references. Hosea chapter 6, verse 7, he says, But they, like men, have transgressed the covenant. They have dealt treacherously against me. And so this is, again, their, their culture, their heart, their personality, what they're doing. They, they, uh, they've transgressed the covenant. They're not trying to obey it. They're not looking to even acknowledge it. They're transgressing it. Uh, they have dealt treacherously against me, God says. This is who they are. <clears throat> so we go to Hosea chapter 7, verse 2. 
It says, and they consider not in their hearts that I remember. I can go here. Uh, that I remember all their wickedness. Now their own doings have beset them about. They are before my face. And so he's saying, and they consider not in their hearts that I remember all their wickedness. So in the deep uh, you know, part of their hearts, where where sin originates, where where you know everything is supposed to be you know, about them, he says that now uh, now they consider not in their hearts that I remember all their wickedness. You know, God doesn't forget anything. God is omniscient. God is omnipresent. He's the fullness of the Godhead bodily. That's the Lord Jesus Christ, let alone the Godhead. You know, God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. And so, no, knowing, you know, all knowing, omniscient, omnipresent. Uh, that I remember their wickedness. Now their own doings have beset them about. They are before my face. So if we look, for example, at, if we'll go to uh, Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 19, Jeremiah also had problems you know, during his time. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 2 and verse 19. This is what he says here. <clears throat> he talks about, and they consider not in uh, their hearts that I remember all their wickedness. Now their own doings have beset them about. They are before my face. Jeremiah 2 19 says, Thine own wickedness shall correct thee, and thy backsliding shall reprove thee. Know therefore, and see that it is an evil thing and bitter that thou hast forsaken the Lord thy God and that my fear is not in thee, saith the Lord of hosts. You know, that's, a, that's a scary thought that this is what's going on in Jeremiah's day. This is going on in Hosea's day. Israel is just falling apart more and more and more. And that's uh, Jeremiah chapter 2, uh, verse 19. If you look at Jeremiah chapter 4, and verse 18. And he says, thy way... And thy doings have procured these things unto thee. This is thy wickedness, because it is bitter, because it reaches into thine heart. And so he's talking about how the wickedness has you know, reached into their hearts. See this there? But then it says that now, thy, now their own doings have to set them about, you know, based on you know, their, their reactions and the thoughts, the wicked, and, the wicked intents and thoughts of their hearts. If you look at there before thy uh, my face, like in Jeremiah 16, verse 17, saying in the book of Jeremiah, just using that as a cross reference, where uh, Hosea says, You know, they are before my face, it's you know, speaking for God. He says, They are before my face. It's Jeremiah 16, verse 17. He says, For mine eyes are upon all their ways, they are not hid from my face, neither is their iniquity hid from mine eyes. So God is seeing everything that's going on with this culture or with these with the politics of what's going on with Ephraim and, and the northern kingdom when it comes to Hosea. Uh, we're seeing this is also happening with Jeremiah. And so we're learning from what's happening with Jeremiah as it's happening with Hosea. And as we see that in verse 2, he's saying, I beset them about, they are before my face. God can see it all, whether it be the eyes of his face, you know, and that's an anthropomorphism, you know, God really having eyes and face and ears and nose and mouth, uh, that type of thing. Uh, but this is, you know, Hosea chapter 7, verse 2. So as we get into verse 3, this is where we're getting more even into. He says, they make the king glad with their wickedness and the princes with their lies. Again, he's talking about not just the culture, but the politics, you know, when it talks about the king and the kingdom and what's going on with what the king is doing and what the citizens are doing with the king and how things are working, about the mechanics of the politics of the time. He says they, you know, Israel, the, the citizens, the kingdom of priests, quote unquote, make the king glad with their wickedness. So as he's going through the same the evil kings of the nation, king or kings, depending on what's going on, are actually rejoicing to see the people acting wicked. You know, they're liking that. And so the, the people want to make the king happy by acting wicked. And it says, uh, now their own doings, I'm sorry, reading the wrong before, it says, and the princes with their lies, the, the people would rather lie to the princes and act wicked for the kings. And this is the kind of culture 
that Israel is doing in Hosea's day. And you can parallel this with a lot of what's going on in today's day and age too. So you kind of hear the spiritual lessons kind of being poured out in today's culture as well. Again, this is a good benefit we're learning from and understanding. But again, uh, this is what we're seeing. They make the king glad with their wickedness and the princes with their lies. If we go and look to the book of Micah, and we'll see it here, chapter 6, verse 16. That's the book of Micah, uh, chapter 6, verse 16. As we see that there, as they say, they make the king glad with their wickedness and the princes with their lies. Micah chapter 6, verse 16 says, For the statutes of Omri are kept, and all the works of the house of Ahab, and uh, ye walk in their counsels, that I should make thee a desolation, and the inhabitants uh, thereof a hissing. Therefore, ye shall bear the reproach of my people. And that he's saying again that these citizens are actually uh, you know, doing wicked things for the king and, do, and, and, and speaking lies to the princes. They're, in this case, during Micah's day, they're upholding the statutes of uh, false gods, you know, uh, wicked doctrines, and, and, and the works of the house of Ahab. You know, wicked things that they're doing. They're upholding these things happily. And so that's a, a wicked thing. And in Micah chapter 7, looking at verse 3, it says that they may do evil, uh, that they may do evil with both hands earnestly. Uh, the prince asketh and the judge asketh for a reward and the great man, and uh, he uttereth his mischievous desire, so they wrap it up. Again, hearing about how there's corrupt judges, how there's corrupt kings, how there's corrupt princes, you're seeing the mechanics of a corrupt society here. This is what Micah was happening in Micah's day. You're seeing a little bit from what's happening in Jeremiah's day. But this is also plugging into what we're seeing in Hosea's day. Again, it says that uh, they may do evil with both hands earnestly. The prince asketh, asketh, and the judge asketh for a reward. The judge asketh for a reward, you know, for like a bribe. And it says, uh, and the great man, he uttereth his mischievous desire. Uh, so they wrap it up. You know, it's like a wrap. They do what they need to do uh, for a bribe or otherwise. That's uh, the culture. You can parallel that to today as well. So we see this here. And then we see as we go back to Hosea chapter 7, uh, verse 4, says, they are all adulterers. As an oven heated by the baker who ceaseth from uh, raising after he uh, hath kneaded the dough until it be leavened. So now he's going to start to paint a picture here. But you're seeing they are all adulterers. And you can find all sorts of verses about uh, adulterers and adultery. James chapter 4, verse 4 is a good cross reference. I'll just present that to you and let you see the verse. Uh, they are all adulterers. But then he starts to give an illustration. As an oven heated by the baker, who ceaseth from raising after he hath uh, kneaded the dough. So we've got here a picture where we're seeing that the oven is heated. Is what we're seeing. The dough is kneaded when it comes to, uh, like, a, 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 as it says there, a baker who heats up an oven, uh, kneads the dough, gets the dough ready. And kind of the work of, of uh, heating up the oven and having the dough ready to go, uh, he bakes just enough dough to, you know, or... He has the, um, he lets the oven do its thing. He lets the dough do its thing. And it's just a matter of time before everything falls into place is where it's going with this. It just takes time for everything to do what needs to be done. Uh, it says, uh, as an oven heated by the baker who ceaseth from raising after he hath kneaded the dough until it be leavened. It just needs to be leavened. So uh, the oven is set. The uh, dough is, is kneaded. It just needs to be leavened. Just a matter of letting uh, all the pieces are in place. And it says there that the baker ceases from raising. He, he's got everything where it needs to be. Uh, we see here that they are all adulterers. Now it's going back to the citizens of Israel saying that uh, everything is essentially set. All the wickedness of the citizens of Israel, pretty much all set. And uh, here's what he's going to continue on explaining this. In verse 5, it says, In the day of our king, the princes have made him sick with bottles of wine. He stretched out his hands with scorners. And uh, you can remember scorners. Uh, Psalm chapter 1 talks about sitting out in the council of scorners. And uh, talks more about this even in Proverbs. You know, scorners have led to the king to be corrupt. Um, but we see that there. This is... Um, Hosea chapter 7, verse 5. Psalm chapter 1 is mainly the best cross-reference to really see, you know, cross-references on that. 
but it's referring back to verse four about the uh, adulterers and how uh, the illustration of the baker's got the heater on, he's kneaded the bread, all it takes is time to make things happen to where the bread's going to be leavened just right. Now he's saying, um, in the day of our king, princes have made him sick with bottles of wine, and uh, he stretched out his hands with the scorners, the scorners being the citizens, and the princes are, are making the king drunk with wine and so forth. Verse 6 is, for they have made ready their heart like an oven. So they made their heart ready like an oven, whilst they lay in wait. Uh, their baker sleepeth all the night. Uh, in the morning it burneth as a flaming fire. Verse 7, they are all uh, hot as an oven, and they uh, have devoured their judges, and all the kings are fallen. There is none among them that calleth unto me. So again, he's saying the heart is for these scorners and these idolaters and these adulterers. Their heart is like the oven. And he's saying uh, when it comes to their wicked works, their wicked works are like the bread. And he's saying that pretty much, you know, the baker's pretty much gone to sleep and left everything, you know, to, to just go to work. Just a matter of time before uh, everything just falls into place for just a, a total storm of, of wickedness. And it says that they're all as hot as an oven and have devoured their judges. All their kings are fallen. There is none among them that calleth unto me. So he's saying the same concept, just as a baker can just set things up and leave things ready to go, time will just let everything fall into place. He's saying, you know, Israel, your heart is as, you know, like that burning oven. Your works are as like that bread, just wicked as can be. Give it time, everything will fall into place. That fifth course, that fifth course of judgment where Assyria comes to take you away, just give it time. It's just going to all fall into place. You've done it all. Your heart is as wicked as a, as a burning oven. Your works are like that kneaded bread. Just give it time. It will all hook up for you in the right ways, and you will have Assyria take you away. You've done it all. You know, you, you don't need, you know, everything will fall into place. And so he's saying, they're all as hot as an oven. And we see that there uh, in verse 7, and has devoured their judges. All their kings are fallen. There is none among them that calleth unto me. So we're seeing again how wicked this society, this culture, these politics, these kings, these citizens are. And there's not supposed to be like that at all. So we see that there says Ephraim, he had mixed himself among the people. Ephraim, and here's our verse, is a cake not turned. So we talked about that a little bit earlier. Ephraim is a cake not turned. You know, they're half baked. They're for God's plans. They're unusable. If we kind of look at um, Hosea chapter eight, verse two, it says that the Israel shall cry unto me. My God, we know thee. Uh, and it says, Israel hath cast off the thing that is good. The enemy shall pursue them. They have set up kings, but not by me. They have made princes, and I knew it not, of their silver and their gold have they made them idols that they may be cut off. And so we're seeing there, this is what Israel has done as far as what they've set up, the, the, the nation that they've set up, the uh, uh, the kings and the idols and everything, they've set things up that God never told them to do. And so as you see that there, it says in verse 8, Ephraim, he hath mixed himself among the people. Now what Ephraim has done, even beyond worse than what they've already set up themselves to be, is that they've mixed themselves among the people. Now the people that they're talking about are the Gentiles. Now Israel's not to do that. Israel's supposed to be a people, you know, above the head, not the tail. They're supposed to be, you know, a, a, a holy people where they don't go and do that. If anything, the other nations in prophecy with law, in the dispensation of law, the nations are supposed to be coming to Israel. We're seeing here in the book of Hosea, they're so wicked that it's the other way around. They've gone and they've run off to other nations for support. They're not dependent on God. They're not looking towards God. They're not hoping for God. They're not leaning on God's dependency. They're going to other nations saying, hey, why don't you help us out and we'll help you out. And we have such verses as that. If we look at Hosea chapter 5, verse uh, 7. Hosea chapter 5, verse 7. says that they have dealt treacherously against the Lord, for mm -hmm. they have begotten strange children. Now shall a month devour them with their portions. If we look at verse 13 in Hosea chapter 5, it says, When Ephraim saw his sickness, and Judah saw his wound, then went Ephraim to the Assyrian, 
and sent to King Jareb. Yet could he not heal you nor cure your cure you of your wound. And so he's saying he, uh, Israel goes off, specifically Ephraim, goes off to other people in other nations looking for help, looking to get their sicknesses cured or their economic issues fixed or their problems you know, to be settled by running off to other nations and asking them for help rather than being dependent on the true and living God, which was what Israel was supposed to do in prophecy. So we're seeing this taking place here. And they're saying that Ephraim hath mixed himself uh, among the people. This is what you know they're doing here. And so this is something that's you know taking place here, and that's not something they're supposed to be doing. If you look at uh, he says it's a cake not turned. And so verse nine says, and we'll kind of keep looking at some verses here. He says, Strangers have devoured his strength. And, and this is Hosea chapter seven, verse nine. Strangers have devoured his strength, and he knoweth it not. Yea, gray hairs are here and there upon him, yet he knoweth not. So as these other nations, as they as he leans on other nations for support, Ephraim, Israel, leans on other nations for help, you know, help us. We're, you know, we, we need help economically, we need help politically, we need help with uh, health and wealth and prosperity and so forth. He says, these strangers have devoured his strength. You know, they're tricking him. It says, and he knoweth it not. Israel doesn't even know it. These kings don't even know what's happening. Again, you can apply this to you know, modern day society here as well with a spiritual lesson you know, attached to that. It says, yea, gray hairs are here and there upon him, and he knoweth it not. It's like uh, you know, when, when someone doesn't know their age, and you see this here, that you know, they, they think, uh, Israel thinks that they're you know, really, you know, really powerful, amazing nation, but they're really not who they think they are. We see that there in verse 9. And so if you look at Isaiah chapter 42, verse 22, Isaiah had the same issues going on in his day. Isaiah chapter 42, verse 22. You see this here. And it's the same issues that were going on earlier as they were talking about the, the robbers and the thieves and the murderers and the adulterers. It says in Isaiah 42, verse 22, says, But this is a people robbed and spoiled. They are all of them snared in holes, and they are hid in prison houses. They are, are, they are for a prey, and none delivereth, for a spoil, and none saith restore. Who among you will give ear to this? Who will hearken and hear for the time to come? Who gave Jacob for a spoil and Israel to the robbers? Did not the Lord, he against whom we have sinned? For they would not walk in his ways, neither were they obedient unto his law. Therefore, therefore he hath poured out, I'm sorry, poured upon him the fury of his anger and the strength of battle, and it hath set him on fire round about, yet he knew not, and it burned him, yet he laid it not to heart. So it's kind of that concept again, saying, well, people are, are as we're seeing in verse 9, uh, strangers devoured his strength, and he knew it not. Yea, gray hairs are here and there upon him, and he knoweth it not. As uh, we're seeing that the, in Isaiah 40 or 2, uh, 25, it says, uh, set him round, on fire round about, and yet he knew not. And it burned him, and yet he laid it not to heart. He just, he, this is a nation that has no clue what's going on around him. This is a nation that has no idea uh, that the kings are, are wicked and, and doing all these things, even though the citizens themselves are wicked and doing also the same thing. You can just apply so much to what we're seeing around us as well. And yet we're not them, they're not us, but the same principles are being applied, the same issues you can see and kind of pretty much apply and see what was happening then is kind of what's happening now. And yet, you know, this we can learn from this. What was written four times is written for our learning, the Apostle Paul says. So we're learning from this. It's just we're not them, they're not us. This is Israel and prophecy. And so we see this here in verse 9. And so as we go into verse 10, we're seeing, of course, to whom this is all written to. And it says, and the going back to Hosea chapter 7, verse 10, and the pride of Israel it uh, testifieth to his face, and they do not return to the Lord their God, nor seek him for all this. Again, if we look at Hosea chapter 5, verse 5, as a cross-reference, 
you see it again talking about the pride of Israel. So again, when you see Ephraim, it's Israel, and Israel it's Ephraim. So we know this is all talking about the 12 tribes of Israel. More so, that's the audience of this book. This is in Hosea chapter 5, verse 5. Uh, and the pride of Israel doth testify to his face. Therefore shall Israel and Ephraim fall in their iniquity. Judah also shall uh, also shall fall with them. And so we're seeing that Judah will, Judah's going to fall with them as well. The southern kingdom is going to fall just as much as the northern kingdom is going to fall. But the southern kingdom is going to fall to Babylon. The northern kingdom is going to fall to Assyria. And we know history proves that this is exactly what happened as a result of the forces of judgment. But we see that in verse. 10, that the pride of Israel testifieth to her face, and they do not return to the Lord their God, nor seek him for all of this, for everything that's happening. That there's a, this, this nation is supposed to be God's holy, and it will be God's holy nation after God comes and restores everything. But right now, without them dependent on God, calling upon the name of the Lord, Israel being dependent on the Lord, they are a corrupt nation. And they're seeing how wicked everything is as they are just falling apart there. So as we see this here, we go into Hosea chapter 7, verse 11. And it says, Ephraim also is a silly dove without heart. They call to Egypt. They go to Assyria. This kind of goes back to what we were seeing in verse 8 when it said, Ephraim, he hath mixed himself among the people. Ephraim is a cake not turned. There's our, again, our verse, our half-baked cake that we're looking at. Hosea's half-baked cake. Uh, it says that he hath mixed himself among the people, and we saw some cross-references seeing how Israel had run off and was dependent on other nations. Well, verse 11, here's some of these other nations. It says, Ephraim is, uh, also is like a silly dove without heart. And so when it uses that illustration, just like we saw the cake illustration, we're seeing a second one here, a silly dove without heart. So this is like a bird just flying around, flapping around all over the place, not really having any purpose, but yet flying all over the place, trying to do something. Uh, we're seeing here, it says, they call to Egypt, they go to Assyria. So they're calling out to Egypt, you know, looking for help and assistance and looking to get something out of it, some sort of, you know, health and wealth and, you know, help us with our problems and help, let's make a deal here. And they go to a Siri. So they should be calling on the name of the Lord. Uh, but we're seeing that here in verse 11. That uh, if, if you look even at Hosea chapter 11, verse 11, you see it again. Just as a cross reference Hosea 11, 11, you see exactly almost the same verse written verbatim, just in different details. It says, they shall tremble as a bird out of Egypt and as a dove out of the land of Assyria, and I will place them in their houses, saith the Lord. So again, the same type of idea is written in Hosea chapter 11, verse 11. You're getting more of a picture of what this book is about. And that's what we're trying to do today, is kind of give this you know, a quick rundown. But uh, you're seeing it mainly through where we're looking at in verse, uh, chapter 7. But this is what they're doing. It is that they, they go, or they call to Egypt, they go to Assyria. If we look at Hosea chapter 9, verse 3, kind of using the cross-references we can get right here, right now. It says in Hosea chapter 9, verse 3, that they shall not dwell in the Lord's land, but Ephraim shall return to Egypt, and they shall eat unclean things in Assyria. And of course, that's not good. We know from Leviticus chapter 11, there's a whole list of things that are clean and unclean, and there's things that they're not supposed to eat. But in Assyria, they don't practice that. In Assyria, there's not 613 points of law that they're going to adhere to as strictly as they should in Israel. But even in Israel, they're not doing that. They're not upholding anything. But they run to Assyria. They run to Egypt looking to see what they can get in order to prosper. And so they go and they'll do, they'll do what they have to do. They'll eat unclean things. They'll disobey the law. And in the dispensation of law, that's the greatest sin that's you know, going on there, aside from diso being disobedient to God and uh, you know, breaking all these laws, eating unclean things, even in different Gentile nations. This is how far and decrepit this kingdom of priests has become. So as we come back to Hosea chapter 7, verse 11, they call to Egypt, they go to Assyria. So we see that there. Then we go to verse 12. It says, when they shall go, I will spread my net upon them. I will bring them down as the fowls of the heaven. I will chastise them as their congregation hath heard. 
So, of course, it says that first part there in verse 12, when they shall go, and that's when they talk about when they go to Egypt and when they go to Assyria and when they go to these other nations looking for help, instead of calling upon God, whom they should, because they're supposed to be the kingdom of priests, they're supposed to be God's people. It says, uh, I will spread my net upon them, which means he's got, he's got something in store for them. I will bring them down as the fowls of heaven. He says, I will chastise them as their congregation hath heard. Of course, now where did they hear about this? Is in Leviticus chapter 26, with the five courses of judgment. And of course, I'll just give a quick rundown. It's, it's, uh, we don't have enough time to just sit there and read it word for word. But in Leviticus chapter 26, verse 13 through 17, is judgment number one, uh, Israel, a judgment on Israel's uh, health and borders. And uh, then we judgment number two, Leviticus chapter 26, 18 through 20, judgment on Israel's power and climate. Judgment number three is Leviticus chapter 21 through 22, judgment on uh, uh, judgment of the wild beasts, where the bears come out and kill all the kids that say thou bald head and as time marches on. Judgment number four is Leviticus 26, 23 through 26, judgment of uh, famines and invasions and so forth uh, during the times of these different kings. And then finally, judgment number five is going to be the judgment of captivity in Leviticus chapter 26, verses 27 through 39. And that's where you get uh, the northern king taken away by Assyria, and you get the uh, southern king kingdom taken away by Babylon. And when you see this in verse 12, he says, I will chastise them as their congregation hath heard. They heard about it when the law was being presented. Uh, and they heard about it through Leviticus chapter 26, as it was read to them, that was told to them at one point in time. And so they knew these five courses of judgment were was a thing, and it was going to take place. And if they keep up these wicked acts, and this wicked culture, and these wicked politics, and these wicked kings, and these wicked things, Leviticus 26 will continue to play into effect. These five courses of judgment will continue to play out. And everything will go into effect concerning the northern kingdom. And Assyria will come, and that's what chapter 10 is all about in the book of Hosea. Assyria will play out. There will be no escaping it. There will be no, you know, unless they change their mind, which means repent. Uh, unless they change their mind, that is will what take place. So I will chastise them as their congregation hath heard. Verse 13 goes on to say, Woe unto them, for they have fled from me destruction unto them because they have transgressed against me though i have redeemed them yet they have spoken lies against me if we look at hosea chapter 11 verse 2 god talks about this a little more as we use quick cross references to see it he says as they called them so they went from them they sacrificed unto balaam and burnt incense to graven images. So rather than as we see there in Hosea chapter 7, verse 13, he says, though I have redeemed them, and that's redeemed them out of Egypt from the captivity of Pharaoh in the book of Exodus, yet they have spoken lies against me. And they go off and they burn incense to Balaam, and they burn incense to these false gods, and they practice wickedness and serve kings wickedly and do things that are against God's 613 points of law. He's saying, Though I've redeemed them, I'm the redeemer. I've redeemed them from their captivity in Egypt. They would sooner go off and speak lies against me. And so we're seeing how ungrateful this society is. And again, you can think about how this works out in modern day society as well. You can kind of plug that in and see spiritual lessons out of this. That, you know, while this is historically accurate, this, this literally took place historically, we're learning a lot from Hosea's time from where we are right now. So, yet they have spoken lies against me. This is what we see in verse 13. And so he says, uh, as we kind of continue, he says in verse 14, and they have not cried unto me with their heart, which kind of goes back to what we were seeing in uh, all the way back at the beginning. I think it was in verse uh, 2 of uh, Hosea chapter 7. And they considered not in their hearts that I remember all their wickedness. It all was about their hearts. It was in their hearts that sin originated. It was in their hearts that sin was the problem. It all goes back to the heart of this culture and this society. And we see in verse uh, 14 that they have not cried unto me with their heart. And uh, it's all about their, their hearts that uh, they're not considering in their hearts that I remember their wickedness. And I think it's even in verse 6 
uh, verse six, yeah, that they have made ready their heart like an oven with all this wickedness and the illustration of the oven and the bread and so on and so forth, uh, with also the illustration of uh, in verse 11, Ephraim is also like a silly dove without heart. So the, the Lord is explaining, uh, using Hosea to explain to this uh, culture of Hosea, this, this, this citizenship that it's all about their heart. He says, and they have not cried unto me with their heart, as we're seeing from verse uh, 14, uh, when they howled upon their beds, they assemble themselves for corn and wine, and they rebel against me. If we look at Hosea chapter 2, verse 4, when we see the issues of uh, Gomer, uh, Hosea's wife, you remember, he married. Uh, let's see, and I'll read this here. It's actually in Hosea chapter 1, verse 2. I'll just read this real quick before I get to Hosea chapter 2. Hosea chapter 1, verse 2 says, The beginning of the word of the Lord by Hosea, And the Lord said to Hosea, Go and take thee a wife of whoredoms, and children of whoredoms, for the land hath committed great whoredom, departing from the Lord. Uh, it says, uh, And he went and took Gomer, the daughter of Dibliam, which conceived and bare him a son. And it kind of goes on from there, but this is where you see that this was what God told him to do, to, to marry uh, someone from uh, the the area of Hodoms. But in uh, Hosea chapter 2, verse 4, I believe it is. Yeah, Hosea chapter 2, verse 4. Uh, it says here, and I will not have mercy upon her children, for they be the children of whoredoms, for their mother hath played the harlot. Uh, she hath conceived them that uh, them hath done uh, shamefully. For she hath said, I will go after my lovers that give me my bread and my water, my wool and my flax, my oil and my drink. Therefore, behold, I will hedge up my uh, way with thorns and make a wall that she shall not find her paths. And she shall follow after her lovers, but she shall not overtake them. And she shall seek them, but she shall not find them. Then she shall uh, say, I will go and return to my first husband, for it was better with me than now. Uh, for she did not know that I gave her corn and wine and oil and multiplied her silver and gold, which they prepared for Baal. Therefore, I will return and take away my corn in the time thereof and my wine in the season thereof and will recover my wool and my flax given to cover her nakedness. And now will I discover her lewdness in the sight of her lovers and none shall deliver her out of my hand. I will also cause all her mirth to cease, her feast days, her new moons and her Sabbaths and all her solemn feasts. So we see this back in verse 14. It says, uh, going back to Hosea chapter 7, verse 14, it says, And they have not cried unto me with their heart, when they howled upon their beds, they assembled themselves for the corn and wine. And when they assembled themselves for the corn and wine, you're seeing in Hosea chapter 2, what we just read, that even when Gomer, she assembled herself for corn and wine, she thought it was something she was going to gather the corn and the wine for her lovers. When that corn and wine was gathered by her husband, uh, Hosea, and it was meant, you know, for her, for her nourishment, she was gathering it to give to her multiple lovers. And so we're seeing even then the, the heart and the mindset of what was going on as she represented a rebellious Israel. Uh, and Hosea represented what God was providing, the provision and, and the, uh, the generosity and the wealth of what God was doing. Uh, he says, and they rebel against me in verse 14. This is from what we're seeing over there in uh, Hosea chapter uh, 2, uh, verse 4. If we look at Hosea chapter 3, in verse 1, it says, then, the Lord, uh, then said the Lord unto me, Go yet, love a woman beloved of her friend, yet an adulteress, according to the love of the Lord, toward the children of Israel, who look to other gods and love flagons of wine. So this is something that the Lord is again using for an illustration, using to teach a point, and you know, let Israel know this is kind of the relationship we have now until you repent. And so this is what we're seeing in the book of Hosea. As we go to Hosea chapter 7, and we'll see in verse 15, it says, And they rebel against me. It says, Though I have bound and strengthened their arms, yet do they imagine mischief against me. And we're seeing that even in verse 15, he's continuing to say this. And if we look at Psalm 106, verse 43, See a good cross reference there, Psalm 106, verse 
this is a good cross reference for that because we're seeing in Hosea chapter 7 verse 15 says though I have bound and strengthened their arms yet do they imagine mischief against me and we see there in verse uh, Psalm 106 verse 43 it says many times did he deliver them but they provoked him with their counsel and were brought low for their iniquity nevertheless he regarded their affliction when he heard their cry and he remembered for them his covenant and repented according to the multitude of his mercy so it's all about the multitude of his mercies not their wickedness not anything that has to do with them because if we look at who they are we're seeing how wicked they've become how wicked this society has become apart from god as they turn away from god and they refuse to call upon the name of the lord this is what Israel is like. This is what their culture is like. This is what their politics are like. This is what their kings are like. This is what their society is like. As these Old Testament prophets, whether it be Jeremiah, whether it be Isaiah, whether it be Hosea, whether it be Micah, they keep showing up, they keep proclaiming the word of the Lord, and they keep being ignored by Israel, who are supposed to be, in prophecy, God's gentle blessings. They keep, disobe they keep disobeying God. So we see this here, but if we look at verse 16 in Hosea chapter 7, he says, They return, but not to the Most High. They are like a deceitful bow. Their princes shall fall by the sword for the rage of their tongue. Uh, this shall be their derision in the land of Egypt. He says, They return, but not to uh, the Most High. They are like a deceitful bow. A good cross reference for this. We'll just give out the verse and let you refer to it uh, just for time's sake is Psalm 78, verse 57. Uh, the deceitful bow verse, where we see this again in the book of Psalms, Psalm 78, verse 57, talking about a deceitful bow, says, their princes shall fall by the sword for their rage of their tongue. And this is going to be when Assyria comes, takes them away, and uh, you know, according to the fifth course of judgment in Leviticus 26, specifically 26, verse 27 through 39. It says, this shall be their derision. In the land of Egypt. Now we just went through a definition of the land uh, of the word derision when we were in Psalm chapter two, verse four. We did a study on that probably about two or three studies ago when we called this one the Lord snickers or the Lord laughs. And the last part of that verse was when we were talking about uh, so, um, when we were talking about how the Lord shall have them in derision. This was with the last part of Psalm chapter two, verse four. We did a study on that you know, three or four lessons ago but again that definition of derision was expressing contempt or scorn mocking or ridiculing we were saying how battles such as armageddon would have a multitude of bodies uh, and carcasses based on uh, isaiah 66 verse 23 and 24 and zechariah chapter 12 verse 11 the lord would laugh and conquer and judge and make war and have his enemies his nations in derision this is the study we had before now we see that word derision coming up again saying they return, but not to the most high. This culture, this, this, group, this group here, this Israel, uh, they are like a deceitful bow. They're princes, which are wicked and they're drunk and they're, they're deceived by the people, shall fall by the sword, and that's of Assyria, from the fifth course of judgment, uh, for their rage of their tongue. This shall be their derision in the land of Egypt. So derision is something that will continue to take place. But eventually... Uh, there's going to be rest, eventual restoration. If we kind of flip over to Hosea chapter 14, <clears throat> and we don't have much time, so we'll just kind of look at it basically. But what you're seeing here is, uh, let's see if we can find it here. Uh, Hosea chapter 14, verse 4, talks about how eventually after all of everything that takes place, God in his infinite mercies will be the one who puts everything back into place. We can see this in the ages to come. That, you know, even, because even Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is future from where Hosea, the book of Hosea takes place. And then from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, Hebrews through Revelation, the events of the book of Revelation is future from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, just to explain the timeline there in the Bible. But we see there in Hosea chapter 14, verse 4, it says, I will hear their backsliding, or heal their backsliding. I will love them freely, for mine anger is turned away from him. I will be as the dew unto Israel. He shall grow as the lily and cast forth his roots as Lebanon. His branches shall spread, and his beauty shall be as the olive tree, and his smell as Lebanon. They that dwell under his shadow shall return. 
uh, they shall revive as the corn and grow as the vine, and the scent thereof shall be as the wine of Lebanon. So eventually, he's saying things will get better. Things will, you know, Israel will return into their nation after they get scattered into Assyria. Uh, they will return. God will return them. We see this in the book of Isaiah. We see in the book of Jeremiah uh, that they will be brought back, and then the kingdom will be set up, and the kingdom will be restored. You can see this Again, just to give this out, Hosea chapter 14 is a good cross-reference with Zechariah chapter 14 and Isaiah chapter 66 and Revelation chapter 21. So I want to give those chapters out as we start to wrap things up here. But you're seeing that Hosea does have, as we'll call it, a happy ending. You're seeing restoration. You're seeing where things are getting back together. But it does take God and his infinite mercy and justice and wisdom to bring all things back together again, in spite of the wickedness and politics and culture of what Israel's done to itself. So we see that there. But uh, it also reminds me of uh, when we were studying, uh, I think it was Zechariah chapter two, verse six, back in the back in the time, uh, where it said, "For I say, the Lord will be a wall unto a wall of fire round about Israel." And I will be the glory in the midst of her. This is, we're talking about this restoration here. That's uh, from Zechariah chapter 2, verse 6, which is also a good cross-reference for Zechariah chapter 9, verse 8. And uh, Psalm chapter 46, verse 7 through 11. This is what we had done from that previous study as we connect and collect the dots into that. So we're seeing that this is the things that take place here. But Isaiah chapter 11, Isaiah 57 Jeremiah 30 and Jeremiah 31 show the people coming back into Israel, being restored into Israel, God setting up his kingdom, and everything being kind of put back together again. And so I'm just leaving with a bunch of cross-references there, but this is kind of where we're going to wrap things up as time is running out. But uh, nonetheless, we wanted to go through Hosea's half-baked cake show you why it's called the half-baked cake, get into a little deeper examination of the culture, the politics, and how Israel is when they're left alone to themselves, and how they just refused in history to return back to God, and why the Assyrian captivity needed to take place to the northern kingdom, and how eventually it took place to the southern kingdom through Babylon as well. Nonetheless, God and his infinite wisdom through the prophetic program will bring everything back together again, and he'll have um, you know, all of the earth, you know, uh, in his in his uh, uh, rule and reign, he'll have the body of Christ, which is us, ruling in the heavenly places, and in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he'll have well, whether they be in Christ and heaven and earth, uh, all will be you know wrapped up under one umbrella. We could call it that, and uh, that's Ephesians chapter one, verse ten and eleven. And uh, all will be you know, ruling under him, essentially, under his order, his, his wisdom and his plans and purposes. So with that, we'll stop here, see if there's any kind of thoughts or uh, comments or questions, and we're going to go into the next study for next time. Okay, so with uh, yeah, with that we'll wrap up uh, for today. But uh, yeah, next time I believe we're going to do a study on uh, the little flock of Israel, which is not the body of Christ, and how uh, there's going to be angels food cake for them in Matthew chapter 24. Uh, so that'll be Sunday. We'll get into that. And it'll be a deeper study where we're collecting more dots, connecting more dots, and bringing them all together so that the Bible is not a confusing book. The Bible, as we read 2 Timothy 2.15, rightly divide the word of truth, everything starts to open up. Everything starts to become clear and, and uh, understandable with clarity so that we can allow this book to be clear, understandable. No, we don't fit in certain books, but we can under, understand them to whom it's written to. And other books are completely to us, and we can go ahead and obey literally everything that's in there. So uh, with that, we'll, we'll stop here, and we'll go ahead and get to the uh, next study on Sunday. Everyone, thanks for joining us, and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see you again. Next time.